Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another football edition of the Play On podcast. This time I have Kieran with me, and we're going to have a look back at what a wonderful weekend of football we just had. Kieran, how's it going? Ah, not bad. Now, Shane, it's what's the crack with you? Uh, it's good to get good to come on, like you know what I mean. So let's get into the games that happened over the weekend. So the first game. But the result, in my opinion, that jumps out at us is the Kerry Tyrone game. Kerry winning this game six goals and 15 points to one goal and 14 points. I think Kerry looked very promising in attack again. Obviously, the six goals screams out, hitting five goals in the first half. I think they just blew Tyrone away. But uh, I don't think we can read into it too much. How do you see this game impacting both teams' mindsets now going forward? Well, I think, to be honest now, I don't think Kerry will look in too much. Tyrone are kind of like struggling, I think, to find their identity since Mickey Hart leaving last year. And they don't really look like they have a, a platform to play off. And obviously they're missing a couple of players too. But uh, Kerry looked very good. like And it looked like they were going for the kill the whole time. Like Clifford, the two Clifford brothers, uh, Moynihan and Gainey look exceptional. Like all six forwards. Uh, were exceptional and basically they weren't threatened at all at the back. So yeah, I was very impressed with them. Like, um, what do you think overall as well? Yeah, no. To be honest, I think Kerry showed. Pat Spillan made a point on League Sunday. He said that this was one of the first times that Peter Keane has actually selected six forwards for Kerry, and I do agree with that. I think that particularly against Cork in last year's championship, they showed them way too much respect. You know, they're trying to set up a defensive barrier against Dublin and Dublin still hit them for four goals. Kerry's forwards, in my opinion, are the best forwards in the country. I think they, you could argue that they're even better than Dublin's. And I think play to your strengths. Kerry are not a very good defensive team. They're a very good attacking team. I think stop trying to play a game that isn't your strength. I think once you saw them fully in motion. Nobody can really stop David Clifford. Paul Ganey, when he's on his day, is unbelievable, as well as you've said. You haven't even mentioned Sean O'Shea yet. These guys are exceptional. And I think, on the other hand, with Tyrone, you're right there talking about their identity. I think having been stuck with Mickey Hart for such a long time, and he had them playing such rigid defensive football, he kind of did experiment with attacking a bit. But for Logan and Dewar to come in, I think... You know, it, it's not just going to happen all of a sudden. It's not going to happen overnight. You know, this transition will take time. And uh, I think, to be honest, the whole thing, Tyrone looked exceptionally loose at the back, which is something that we don't associate with Tyrone. But I think now it would be interesting to see how Tyrone go into the Ulster Championship now after a result like this. Brian Dewar said in the post-match interview that they have a bit of soul-searching to do. Do you see this impact on their chance now in the Ulster Championship? Do you think that this will have an impact on their mentality? Well, they have a, they have Cavan the first round. And as you know, Cavan have a, had a very poor league, relegated to Division 4. So I do think they will get through the first couple of rounds. But a big problem, I think, for Brian Dower uh, is at the moment that um, they don't know their best team. Like, there's probably 25 lads in there that usually, like every team, you'd have... 17, 18 that, you know, will probably play and definitely come on. Where I think he doesn't know what's his best team, like, you know what I mean? So, they, I think they'll struggle, like, they're definitely through a transition. Like, it's definitely going to take two or three years. Like, when you've had Mickey Hart there for 20-odd like, years, he's been there, like, and they haven't conceded six goals for over, I don't know how long. I think there was a stat there I've seen there on Twitter. It was, like, 50 years or something. They haven't conceded yeah. six goals first, which is which is mad, really. Like, but uh, it's definitely a transition period. But on Kerry, there, uh, as you said, they've got the best forwards in the country, and they're playing forward. Like, they were allowed to play now that on on uh, Saturday, and was it? They were allowed to play forward and dominate. But they've got options. Like, I think one of the, their one of their goals, I think, might have been their last goal. Tommy Walsh, a long ball was kicked in to Tommy, and so they have the option of the long ball, like, and they got a breaking ball, got a goal. So uh, they definitely have lots of options. And uh, they're moving really well. Yeah. And I would say right now that I think that they're the best team. That they're the team that you put the most money on to knock Dublin off their perch. And to be honest, this is something that really annoys me because me and Luke did say it last week that we thought that Kerry would beat Tyrone. And because they have, this means that we don't have a league final now. Yeah, I, I saw that, which is a, which is a real strange one because like, any competition deserves a winner and a final, like you know what I mean. So I find uh, 
I wouldn't I wouldn't say Dublin were too happy about it either. Uh, but I saw Derry and Offaly are playing. Yeah. Have agreed to play in a Division Three final. So I wonder now this week will the Dubs and Kerry come to a conclusion and play a game? But uh, then as well they might be giving a lot away to each other uh, because realistically I think as well as you that Kerry are close challengers. If Kerry were uh, reassured defensively. They could, I think they they could beat Dublin easily, but uh, well, they have the best chance to beat Dublin. But uh, yeah, it'd be interesting now to see if there's another uh, if there's a final. Yeah, definitely, because I mean, out of their their last three meetings, I think, or the last four meetings uh, before the league meeting this year, I think Kerry should have beaten Dublin. They should have beaten them in the All Ireland final of 2019, the first game. And they should have beaten them in the league match in 2020. So Kerry definitely can put it up to Dublin. They're the best equipped to do it. And yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet against them beating Dublin this year because players like Clifford now, you know, he was obviously brilliant, but now he's really taken on the kind of captain's role. He's popping up at big moments for Kerry in all the games so far. And I think it would be very interesting to see how they go against Clare because this is a Clare team that has looked pretty good. But if Kerry are serious about winning the All-Ireland, they ought to beat Clare out the gate, just like they beat Tyrone. And uh, I think they're going to do that. And yeah, I think Kerry are definitely going to be Munster champions this year, especially with how hurt they've been from losing last year. Yeah, that definitely last year would have uh, would have stuck to them. You know what I mean? Because after 2019, where you say they arguably should have bet them in the, in the first game, had the chances to. That... Uh, a long winter, like would have really, I think, has brought them on. They they look hungry, as you said. They're going for goals. They had like six goals at the weekend, and I think uh, the last couple of games they've all been getting goals and high scores. So they look hungry. They look uh, like they want it. And as well, like Clifford, as you said, is, is standing up. But everyone around him is standing up. His brother uh, has contributed greatly, and because if Clifford, the great thing about having the, the forwards they have is that. If Clifford's not playing well, like if four or five there, Sean O'Shea will knock over five, six points a game and you yeah. won't even notice. Like, uh, but uh, a lot of them are struggling. Clifford, I think now, him and Callan be the two best in the country at the minute. Clifford, yeah, like yeah. I saw Ronan McNamee there at the weekend trying to mark him. And for the first 10 minutes, I actually thought Ronan uh, was doing okay. Like, it was like, it's so hard. Like, when he, he's big and he's quick and he's powerful, and plus he's got. He's probably the best finisher in the country. So the American from behind, from in front, side on, he's dangerous everywhere. Is so definitely Kerry look like the close to Dublin at the minute if they head on the right track. Yeah, I agree with that one hundred percent. And uh, speaking of Dublin, they got the job done in their semi final. They went up to Donegal. Oh, sorry, they went up to Breffney Park in Cavan, and they won by four points, beating Donegal by one eighteen to one fourteen. I think this was just a classic Dublin win. They got the job done. They had some interesting uh, selections in their team. Sean McMahon started again. I think he's going to start for Dublin in the championship. I think they're trying to bring this lad through. The same thing with Pader Okofic Byrne. I think they're trying to find a midfield partner for Brian Fenton so that they can play James McCarthy in the halfback line and not have to play Brian Howard in midfield, but they can play him half forward or wherever he wants to play. Interestingly, Howard started at half back. But, yeah, some good signs for Donegal, even though they were beaten. Paddy McBrady looked really good. Oran McNeilish, of course, started for Donegal as well. However, the worrying thing is McNeilish and McBrady both had an injury tweak. And I think if they're out for the Ulster Championship, that would be a huge blow to Donegal. Yeah, but them two major now, it was... Uh, McNeilish went off in the first half. They didn't look the same team then as well, and... The likes of Donegal and Tyrone, they're not like Dublin. They don't have the four or five subs to come off the bench and replace these lads. And well, obviously with now Murphy, like Murphy not playing, it was a, uh, it was massive. Like you know what I mean, absolutely huge. But uh, just as you said about uh, Dublin, there, it's like Dublin for the last three or four years in league games. They seem to, I don't know, all of a sudden they don't play too well, but they always get the job done. They have a great mentality at the minute to win games and not play great. Like as you said, it's a typical Dublin win. So, uh, and as well, like I thought Callahan was good. I thought Paddy Small is starting to really uh, show his work. He's had like 
last three or four years he's threatened to I know we played last year but last three or four, four years he's been threatening to get into the team but he's had a lot of injuries and stuff but I think he's starting to show now and show uh, his work to the team Yeah I agree with that I think he's been massively helped by the fact that Paul Mannion has taken the year out of the panel I think that's opened up a spot in the team you see Paddy Small Cormac Coslo Colin Basquale all looking really promising Aaron Byrne again off the bench for Dublin, looked really impressive, scored a great point. And yeah, no, I think Dublin are constantly evolving. That was one of the points that I made, is that if you were to look at the team that started the All-Ireland Final in 2017, even against Mayo, it's very different to the team that we have now. There's a lot of fresh faces in that team. The likes of Owen Merchant, you know, have fully been established now in the Dublin team. And they were bit pack players back then. Dublin bring these lads through that I think in a few years' time, players that, you know, play here and there, like O'Coffick Byrne, like Sean McMahon, like Sean Bugler, will be key to the Dublin team in like the year 2025 or something. I think Dublin constantly evolve and that's why they stay on top because they're not relying on the one crop of players until those players eventually get old and uh, retire. And then they've no one else to come through. They're constantly changing their team. Uh, like I said, I would have put it down very similar to how Manchester United stayed on top under Sir Alex Ferguson. They always signed one or two players every year just to keep the squad ticking over and to keep evolving so that they don't get caught. Yeah, well, I, I said it back in 2018. I told one of my mates here that this, and my, my dad had been saying it for a while as well, that this Dublin team was there to be got. In 2018, I, I had a strange for even Tyrone would have bet them in the All-Ireland final. There was a few, like the likes of uh, Connolly, Dermot Connolly, the Brogans. They'd, lo- they'd lost a few uh, lost a few key players and they looked like slightly they're an older aging team a bit. But the new lads that have came in now, like O'Callaghan's really stepped up, obviously the great final that day in 2018. But they're con- as you said, they're constantly evolving. Like I don't, I personally think, like I, I, I'm a real dub, like I I love the dubs, even though I'm from Wicklow. I think how they play football is great and I I'd love them to win another now this year, like but I just have to admire them. They're always constantly evolving and I hear like Dublin have a have a basketball coach on with them. They're taking different things and different styles. Like I saw uh O'Callaghan there today, I just one of his scores, I think he scored a point off it. He had the ball in his uh running towards a player and like as he went into the player he he hit the player and also swiveled. Like he didn't he made the turn as well as hitting him and he popped it over with his bad foot, which was uh, 35 yards out. Like like they can say a lot of people say about Dublin, the funding and not fair and at the Ring Crow Park. But people actually have to realise the fact that they've they've exceptional, exceptional footballers by I think by far the most balanced team in the country. And uh, the skill level that some of these players are just are natural, like like there was two or three on Donegal team. McBrearty had a great score as well. He held the ball with one hand while a Dublin player was fouling him, uh, holding his other hand. So like just a few like Do- Donegal have two or three them sort of players, but Dublin have fifteen outstanding footballers. And there's no deal with likes of a Coffee Burn and McMahon and a few of these lads coming through. We saw Aaron Byrne come on there as well, and scored a lovely point from the Fina. They're definitely like they're in for the long run. And definitely I can see them a dominance now for two or three years at least more. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. I think it's between Dublin and Kerry now the next the next five to ten years of football. I think Dublin and Kerry will win more than half of the next ten All Irelands, in my opinion. I think they're set up for Kerry obviously have their golden generation, five minor All Irelands coming through, the likes of Sean O'Shea and David Clifford. And Dublin, of course, continue to find youngsters. And you look at even the under-20s, the players that won All-Stars there, the likes of the league, and they're still to come through. So the future looks bright for both these counties. And I think we're in for another classic rivalry between Dublin and Kerry, just like the 70s. Moving on from that game now to arguably more important games, the relegation playoffs in Division 1. These two games were vitally important for all counties that were involved. And it was Monaghan and Armagh that got the job done. We'll start with the Monaghan and Galway game. Monaghan, one goal and 21 points. Galway, two goals and 17 points. This game was fantastic. A real a real nail-biting finish. Conor McManus smacks over an equaliser late in the day. This guy once again saves Monaghan. What a footballer this fella's been. He's an unbelievable player. And yeah, Galway had the game buried 
Galway had the game done. They let Monaghan back into the game. The Darren Hughes goal seemed like a very soft goal to concede, as good as a finish as it was from Darren Hughes. Uh, Monaghan hit one, two in a row, including that goal, to level the game. The top Matthew Tierney was really good for Galway. But apart from that, once again, very, very reliant on Shane Walsh. And yeah, I think they let that game slip away from them. And now they're down in Division 2. Yeah, definitely. Galway left this behind, I felt. They they were far the better team all in in majority of the areas on the pitch. And as you said, the Hughes injury time goal was very uh, very soft to give away. Like they, they had numbers back there to defend the situation. And in that situation, a goal was the only thing Monaghan were really going to get. They weren't going to knock over a couple of points in uh, in late time, in extra time so or in injury time. So uh, definitely, uh, as you said about McManus there, he was uh, there. It, it just shows though that uh, no matter how much, like McManus is a classy footballer, skills, right foot, left foot. He's not the most particularly biggest man in the world, but it just shows that like the skill level, like the like of them Dublin lads have as well. It just beats the fitness levels of like you can be as, as fit and strong and as big and in the gym as much as you as you uh, as you want, which a lot of these Galway lads are probably like. But McManus has that kind of just probably ability now. He can hit off left foot, right foot. You don't know what way he's going to turn, and he has that guile when when you really need him. He stepped up. Matthew Turney was very good as well. Caught a couple of great balls in midfield. Very mobile. Uh, getting around the pitch, breaking up play. He was very good, I thought. But uh, yeah, I'd like to just shout out McCarron as well. Like, he, he kicked seven points. And the winner. He was absolutely exceptional. He got the winner too. Like, yeah, he. Uh, it was brilliant to see because he's had, uh, oh, he's had, he comes from a great family background, GA family background. And uh, he's had terrible injuries now the last three, four years between hamstrings and knees and shoulders and the whole lot. He's, uh, He's really had a tough, and he and he's a real skillful player. So it was delighted to see um, him real showcase his skill, and hopefully now at the weekend now he'll kick him on now and he'll uh, cement his place in that Monaghan team. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And he seemed to be a bit of a forgotten man because earlier on, myself and Luke had been talking about how Monaghan had a lot of new footballers coming out, and the likes of Conor McCarthy looked like they were really starting to catch form. We didn't even mention Jack McCarron when we were talking about the options that Monaghan had. It was all about the new breed. It was all about the likes of Stephen O'Hanlon. And Jack McCarron just puts his hand up again and reminds us how good he is, kicking seven points. And the dummy to set himself up for that last shot at the post was fantastic. I think Monaghan are in... uh, They kind of flew under the radar, Monaghan. Here, we didn't really give them too much of a chance. I think part of it was hugely down to the way that they blew that lead against Cavan in the Ulster Championship last year. They lost a the game that they never should have lost. But they still do have class footballers, particularly their, their half-back line. The young lad, McMenamin, at centre half-back, looks a fine player. And then he's got Carl O'Connell and Ryan McInesby on either side of him. That's a solid, solid half-back line. Niall Cairns back in midfield looks superb. And the forwards, as you mentioned, the forwards that they have are fantastic. And particularly seeing... You know, that Donegal and Tyrone are a bit ropey. Donegal with their injuries, Tyrone in their transition phase. I think Monaghan could actually be a dark horse to win the Ulster Championship. Oh, 100%. They've got arguably some of the best forwards in the country besides Kerry and, and Dublin. Definitely Conor McCarthy uh, was brilliant through the Sigerson Cup too the last couple of years. Definitely their halfback line is very, very mobile, strong. I think uh, finding the balance now for Monaghan is key. The likes of Hughes and a couple of the older lads to to bring on the new uh, the young lads and kind of nur- nurture them so they're not exposed. It can be very daunting, like as a young lad playing at that level. So I, I really hope uh, they kick on because they got to an All Ireland semi final there a couple of years ago, and they probably arguably should have bet Tyrone and got into the final, and they haven't did a whole lot since. So there's probably a chip on their shoulder thinking they're kind of forgotten about in Ulster and definitely in with, and with Cavan getting relegated and now do, uh, Armagh, Donegal and Tyrone all playing Division 1 football. It's really wide open in Ulster and Monaghan probably have a chip on their shoulder a bit and feel a bit forgotten, I reckon. Yeah, no, I would definitely agree with that. I think that Monaghan are flying in in a nice position now heading into the Ulster Championship. They're not quite made favourites. I think a lot of people will tip Donegal but Donegal without Michael Murphy are a completely different team. Yeah, speaking of Armagh, they also stayed up. They beat Ross Common quite convincingly, 117 to 11 points. 
poor uh, league campaign, to be honest, from Roscommon. They went down with a whimper. They started really well. They went five points to one up after 13 minutes. Kieran Murta and Diarmid Murta both looked on fire. But then Armagh just took over after that. They hit five points in a row. They hit one, two after the water break. Ushin O'Neill's goal as well was the result of poor defending. Roscommon turned over easily and Armagh punished them for it. I thought throughout the game there was some there was some super sharp shooting. The likes of Reen O'Neill, Ushin O'Neill and Connor Cox all hit very eye-catching points. But again, Armagh hit the last five points in a row to finish Roscommon off. And to be honest, I don't think Roscommon are a Division 1 team. As harsh as that sounds now, I think they are a Division 2 team. The fact that the last three times now that they've got promoted to Division 1, they've been sent straight back down. It tells me that unless they change something radically, uh, they don't belong at this level. Yeah, I think I think this Roscommon team are coming, this group of Roscommon players are coming towards nearly the end of the road. There's a lot of them with a lot of mileage on the two Murtas, two Smiths. There's a, there's a good few of them that are, have been through the wars and they've been great servants. They've won two or three kind of championships there and been underdogs against the likes of Galway and Mayo and did amazing days out for the people of Roscommon. And, uh, but I definitely think they're struggling. They, ha- they think they're the lowest scorers in Division 1. Uh, they're struggling for forward play. But take away now, uh, the Armagh were brilliant as well now. They think they got... Uh, the O'Neill brothers were exceptional. They got 1-6 between them. Uh, Ushin O'Neill got 1-1 one, one, and Rean O'Neill kicked five points. And all these scores, like Roscommon were sent, set back defensively in, the, in their zones. And Arma, Arma were just pop, popping them over from about 40, 45 yards. Some great kicking from distance. But yeah, Arma will be, will be delighted now to stay in Division 1. It'd be, it'd be a big big boost for the county to get set back sent back to Division Two straight away would have been a would have been poor for them like it would have been a big blow. You got to remember as well this is an Arma team without Jamie Clark, who has been seen for the last five six years as one of the best football best skillful best talented footballers in the country, up there with the likes of uh, Clifford McCallum just because he's from a bit of a weaker county. And, and Arma, he's he's been through an era where Arma haven't been as strong as they were in the two thousands. If he came like, if he came back next year, a foot, a three, then three forwards, a two, two O'Neills and Stefan Clark, Campbell they'd be, well. they'd be hard. No one be, it'd be hard to stop them. Yeah, definitely. I think Arma are in great shape, as you've mentioned. If Clark came back into that team next year, the likes of Jared Oak Burns and Niall Grimley as well, super footballers. They've a very strong midfield. And they seem to have got their swagger back, the swagger that Armagh used to have in the 2000s. They've got that belief about them by the looks of things, Reno O'Neill and Ocean O'Neill. They're good and they have this vibe off them that they know they're good. The shots that they're taking from the angles that they're taking and the distance, they fully believe in their potential and definitely why wouldn't they? An interesting thing for me about Armagh this year is the involvement of Kieran Donaghy. You mentioned how Dublin's basketball coaching is very obvious. The likes of Jason Shaylock there have a huge impact on that side of Dublin's game. Obviously getting Kieran Donaghy in, a man who is so heavily involved in basketball as well. I wonder if he's bringing some of those methods into the Armagh camp. I definitely think so. And a lot a lot of teams in the country, I know the County Wicklow team have a basketball coach on board with them as well. A lot of stuff in the basketball games can be brought in different plays and how they defend space. Against where it's Gaelic football's gone against Matt, it used to be fifth like back in the eighties, nineties, and some of the two thousands, but it'd been man v man, me against whoever you're marking. Where now it's gone against defending the zone where you can score. So definitely Donny I'd say has brought a lot. You can see with the two O'Neills, they're essentially just using the ball and being cute. Donny's not Donny has said it himself, he's not the most glamorous of footballers. He wouldn't have been able to kick scores all day, but he brings a different style to these lads in Armagh. And I definitely think uh, they're definitely picking up a few bits and bobs off him. Yeah, definitely. Um, so that is our coverage of the Division 1 football that happened last weekend. We will come back with our coverage of Division 2. Pan, 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 pan. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Play On Podcast Football Edition. Now we're going to talk about Division 2 and the two teams that were promoted from Division 2 last weekend were Mayo and Kildare. Mayo beating Clare 
by 2.22 to 2.18 down in Cusick Park in Ennis. And Kildare beating me by 1.14 to 14 points. We'll start with the Mayo versus Clare game. Mayo getting the job done. Clare pushed them hard, particularly at the end. Clare were poor in the first half. Then they moved Darren O'Neill into full forward. He started in midfield, but when he moved into full forward, he caused Mayo an awful lot of trouble. My point of view is that Mayo were brilliant in the first half. They could have blown Clare away. They didn't. And I think that's what separates them from Dublin and Kerry. The way that Clare came back at Mayo, Clare would not come back at Dublin and Kerry like that, in my opinion. No, definitely not. Mayo, the last 10 years, arguably should have won in all Ireland or two. But they lack, they lack a rootlessness about them, I feel. They have really won one out and out scoring forward, which is Killian O'Connor. I know Tommy Conroy is coming to his own, but he's still very young. Keenan O'Connor last 10 years and I, I feel like he just hasn't got the help around him. I feel sorry for him a bit, but definitely they slacked in the second half and when O'Connor, the two O'Connors went off injured, they looked uh, they looked a bit uh, lost out there on the pitch. But then as well, they did have the Mayo a great, uh, they'll never give up and that's what kind of got them over the line in the end. In all honest, Clare were woeful the first half. I feel like Getting to Division 1 would have been massive for them. And I think the occasion probably got to them a bit. But uh, as you said, they deployed, deployed O'Neill uh, in full forward in the second half with a long ball tactic and got two goals from it out of nothing, really, which is a worry for uh, for uh, for Mayo, really. But it was also good to see uh, Aidan O'Shea and Kevin McLaughlin back starting. Uh, it was good to see them back starting. Probably minutes under their belt was needed before the Connacht Championship now in a few weeks' time. But uh, I don't know, do you see a, Do you see Mayo again anywhere near this Championship now in a few weeks' time? I uh, wouldn't write them off, to be honest. I think they're, they're blossoming nicely. The likes of Oshin Mullen now has really settled into the team. He got a brilliant goal. I've never seen someone from the full-back line attack the way that he does. Like he's His pace and his power is a real weapon for Mayo going forward. We saw Lee Keegan going forward a bit more, which... Is delightful to see Paddy Durkin as well. His point kind of saw them over the line. He's a massive player for them now, and I think he will be their centre half back this year. But to be honest, I do think you're right when you're talking about the fact that Down O'Neill caused them so much chaos is very concerning for Mayo because there's no way that Galway aren't going to watch that and take notes. And Galway have some big men, the likes of Matthew Tierney that we mentioned, the likes of Paul Kelly, and we haven't even mentioned Damian Comer there. They'll see that Mayo are a little bit vulnerable at the back if you hit them with high balls. Clare got two goals directly off kicking high balls into the square on O'Neill. And I think there's a way, there's a window there for Galway to get the job done against Mayo because I think Mayo have better footballers than them. And Mayo have better footballers than Clare, but Clare still took them so close. And this is a Clare team without the likes of Keelan Sexton, without the Malone brothers. Aaron Fitzgerald, of course, has switched over to the Hurlers. These are big losses for Clare. And, of course, they just had the retirement of Gary Brennan. So it wasn't even as good a Clare team as they've been over the last few years. And yet they caused Mayo all sorts of bother. That being said, I think this Mayo team, for some reason, always seems to play at the level of the team that they are playing against. So 2017 is my example. They went through the qualifiers. They nearly lost to Derry. They got taken to extra time by Derry. Then they ended up going all the way to the final. And they took Dublin to the wire. They seem to step up their game depending on the opposition that they play against. Yeah, 100%. I I 100% believe if Kerry were not to beat Dublin this year or in the next few years, the only other team that could beat them, just based on their, their ability to raise their game to whoever they're playing, it would be Mayo. Mayo arguably should have bet them in a couple of finals there and 100% they seem to raise raise their level to uh, to wherever they're playing they have, a very, they have a very young team they have a lot of uh, a lot of young lads uh, coming through like the likes of Ryan O'Donoghue there and wing back Ushie Mullen won an all-star last year like the goal they scored was absolutely fantastic and they seem to be deploying a lot of uh, running the ball Claire were sitting back very deep and uh, Mayo were uh, were running direct and powerful. They weren't. Uh, it wasn't lethargic and slow. Um, they run Ushin Mullen and uh, I said Paddy Darkin. The, it was the centre back and the the full back combining for the, for the, for his goal, like which was which was great. 
Um, but they have a lot of young lads and they're definitely a team of transition like a lot of teams, I think, in the country. They're definitely going through a patch where they probably don't know their best 15. They're trying lads out. Uh, there was a lot of under-20 lads started their first couple of games of the league. On, on Clare, obviously losing Gary Brennan is massive. Like He's been an absolute legend for them now midfield the last, last how many years. He's, he's great in the air. He's mobile. He's got great feet. He's really the perfect midfielder. And if he, like if Gary was part of a was part of a Dublin or Kerry setup, he'd he'd walk into the starting fifteen, walk in. So losing him, and then losing a couple of lads, the hurlers, Aaron Fitzgerald you mentioned there, obviously uh, it's tough on them. But then as well, six years I think they've been in Division Two, and for a county that their main their main sport is uh, is hurling. It's not bad, like they're a they're a very good dual county, I think, hundred percent. But yeah, Mayo have to go for this All Ireland. I don't think so. I'd put them outside the top four teams in the country at the minute, based on how they're playing. But then as well, if they if they turn around now and they won the All Ireland, I I wouldn't exactly be surprised either. Yeah, um, personally, I think if they won the All Ireland this year, I'd be stunned. I think it's between Dublin and Kerry, to be honest. I can't see anyone outside of them to winning the All-Ireland this year. I think, as you said, Mayo are in transition, Tyrone are in transition, and Donegal just are a wounded animal. They've lost pretty much all their key players from last year. Um, moving on from the Mayo against Clare again, though, we're going to get on to Kildare against Mead. Kildare, one goal and 14 points. Mead, 14 points. This game was definitely a fiery game. The handbags at the end saw Brian Con- and Conor McGill sent off for Mead. Luke Flynn was also sent off earlier in that game. And yeah, Andy McIntyre kind of came out accusing Kildare of some stuff. It was definitely a fiery game considering that these two are battling for who is the second best team in Leinster, in my opinion, after Dublin. Me, you know, they just came short in this game. I think they nearly equalised if they had a chance right at the death, but it was well saved by Mark Donnellan. But Kildare were better than him in this game. I think the huge score was when Kevin Flynn intercepted a hand pass, ran the length of the field. Then he laid it off to Derek Irwin, who was brilliant all game, and he stuck it over with the left boot. That made it 110 to six points. And from then, I think that kind of saw Kildare home. Yeah, Kildare were by far the better team. Their running game was was brilliant. They have a lot of very mobile players at the pitch, and they've got some exceptional forwards. I know Daniel Flynn was injured. He was replaced by... Uh, Aaron Masterson, who's typically typically a, a midfielder, uh, who's very mobile, and he put in a great shift around the middle. But the likes of Jimmy Hyland there in uh, uh, Jimmy Hyland, I we played against uh, under twenties, the under twenty All Ireland team that they they won. They gave us a hiding in uh, in Newbridge one day, and I think Jimmy Hyland scored one thirteen. I think in the at the first half at the half time, I think it was one thirteen to four points. Was the halftime score? I think I think Jimmy scores one ten of those thirteen points. So he's got an exceptional left boot, and I think they're trying to mould him into their kind of key man up front. Uh, but what worries me for Kildare is that they were by far the better team, but they didn't see off the game. They could have they should have they could have won this point or this game by about seven eight points easily, where they struggled in the last quarter uh, to see the game out. Uh, for Mead, Morrissey was good, but then as well, I thought Mead were very were poor enough now, and McIntyre wasn't uh, wasn't too pleased with them. I reckon definitely the brawl at the end kind of just showed uh, frustration growing in Mead near the end of the game. But then as well, I it was it wasn't the most violent of uh, a fight. There there was a couple of sendings off, probably a couple of boxes thrown, but. If that was now in Junior B Championship and we clown out, I'd be seeing his handbags. Like you know what I mean. So uh, yeah, a few injuries though for uh, for Kildare as well. Daniel Flynn obviously got pulled his hamstring there Thursday night, uh, but Cribben went off, and there was one other went off as well. I can't remember now, but uh, Cribben would be a Feely. massive loss. Very mobile. Kevin uh, Feely. I was Kevin Feely. Yeah, Kevin Feely went off, which is yeah, yeah definitely. Like he can play midfield, full forward, great hands. And uh, Kevin would have played a lot of soccer. I think he had a stint in professional soccer when he was younger. So he was, uh, he's very talented. 
Yeah, no, there's no doubt about that. So Kildare and Mayo will play Division 1 football next year. Mayo going straight back up to Division 1 after being relegated last year. Kildare will be playing Division 1 football for the first time since 2018. As for the relegation playoffs, we'll go through these quickly. Cork beat Westmead by three goals and 22 points to 25 points. Westmead had a big loss. Kieran Martin um, did his Achilles before the game. I don't know how Westmead didn't score a goal in this game. Sam McCartan hit a shot off the post that somehow ended up in Michal Martin's hands. He missed another chance in the second half. He blazed it over the bar. Cork's big men stood up at big times. Ian Maguire, his catch and run to set up Luke Connolly for the fisted goal, which was Cork's second goal. That was huge for Cork. They got two goals and eight points off the bench. The likes of Brian Hurley, Mark Collins, when they came in, they definitely swung the game for Cork. As for the other game, Down beat Leash by 219 to 212. Barry O'Hagan scored one goal and nine points. The Down keeper made two huge saves late in the first half, which kind of swung the game in Down's way. What did you make of these two games? Uh, definitely, I was impressed with I was impressed with Westmead. Now, to be honest, it was very they really took the game to uh, to Cork. They I think the, the like it was fourteen fifteen at half time. It was very high scoring. They didn't back off, and especially without Kieran Martin, who was uh, uh, one of the key men for for them, they could have went down there and got hockey and off Cork, who were who were in the Munster final last year and beating Kerry. But they they stood up to them now, and they. Uh, they played. They played very well. I thought uh, there was three thirty-four from play in total of the game. There was it was nearly an out, an out and out shootout. There was goal chances left and centre. And if Westmead could have took their goal chances, they definitely, um, they definitely would have uh, would have been with, in a show with, within the game. Definitely Cork, as you said, Connolly was impressive. His trademark outside the boot balls into the likes of Brian Hurley, setting up Mark Collins' goal was exceptional. And Maguire was a. Uh, was brilliant, uh, especially for the goal running through the middle of the field. But on to Down and Leash, I think uh, I think Down are a Division Two team. They have a couple of exceptional footballers, but the likes of uh, Leash would really, really be disappointed. They would have been hoping now to stay in Division Two and cement their place as a Division Two team over the next couple of years. But Division Three is probably a fair representation of the county now. To be fair, like the likes of the Leinster teams. There's not a whole lot besides Dublin, Kildare, Mead. Leash wouldn't be far off. Leash and West Mead be the next, the next best. So it was a disappointing day for Leash, but I think they can have no complaints. Yeah, no, I agree with that. They, uh, they looked in trouble, in my opinion, right after they lost to Clare in the first game because when I saw the group Kildare, Cork, and Clare, I thought the only game that Leash have a chance of winning here is the Clare game. And when they got beaten by Clare, I know Clare subsequently went on to have a very good campaign. But I thought that's it for Leash now. I, I couldn't see them beating Cork or Kildare. And yeah, in the end, they do go down. But they had a few good years in Division 2. And I think Michal Quirk is he's definitely a good manager. And there's an interesting project happening there at Leash. But I don't think, yeah, I don't think they're a Division 2 team right now. I think how they get on in Division 3 next year will tell us just how good, how good for Division 2 that they are. Because... Personally, I don't think they'd beat Derry or Offaly right now the way that they're playing. But uh, that is our coverage of Division 2 football done. We'll come back through Division 3 and Division 4. Pan, 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 pan. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to part three of the Play on podcast. In this part, we're going to have a look at the action that took place in Division 3 and Division 4 of the Alliance Football Leagues last weekend. Kieran, you're a Wicklow man yourself. You played for Wicklow uh, under 20 and you currently play with the Rat New Seniors. I'd say you're delighted with Wicklow's huge win on the weekend. They beat Cavan. They relegate the Ulster champions. What did you make of this game? I, it was great, you know. It was great to, uh, to see. The lads, like, they've lost their, their first three games in the league and after such a great year last year of uh, getting promoted and getting a championship win against uh, Wexford, it would have been a real, real dampener on the year now and we, the week county Wicklow in general if uh, if we went straight back down so I'm delighted for the lads I'm, I'll be quite close There's, uh, we would we have Jamie there full back uh, and Ross was part Ross O'Brien was part of the panel Jamie Snell both from Rat New and then I know a good few of the lads on the team they're, they're really uh, it's a very young team and they're really really trying hard for Wicklow football to bring it on and uh, 
and they played they played they played a perfect game at the weekend. They probably knew they were never going to score as many points as Cavan. They probably knew goals would have to win the game. But Shawnee Furlong was exceptional. Shawnee, uh, Shawnee got two goals. and Shawnee's been around now 15 years. He's played during the Mick O'Dwyer era where they got to they get one game away from being in all Ireland quarterfinal and played in great wins over Kildare in, in Crow Park. Shawnee got two goals and was exceptional. But yeah, there was a lot of young lads showed up. JP Hurley playing wing back uh, for Mark Lowe. He was an uh, exceptional mobile putting a great shift. Kevin Quinn, who's actually a year younger than me, he's 19 uh, from Blessing, and he played, he replaced Dean Healy, which Dean is a massive loss, uh, captain, kept captain for the last couple of years there. And uh, Kevin Quinn, brilliant. He's he's exceptional footballer. But Kevin would be very disappointed. What do you make of it yourself? Yeah, I was just about to say that. I think as good as Wicklow are, Shawnee Furlong was fantastic. As you mentioned, Wicklow did step up. But if you're the Ulster champions, you shouldn't be going down to Division 4. I think it's embarrassing for Kevin, to be honest. To win the Ulster Championship like they did last year, to have footballers like Gerald McKiernan, they should have never even been in this game in the first place. They shouldn't be losing to Fermanagh and they shouldn't be losing to Derry. I know that Derry are on the come up and Kevin were there for the taking, but I think it was such a poor league for Kevin to to be playing in Division 4 after what they achieved last year is outrageous. To have all-stars galore on your team, the likes of Porrick Faulkner, Raymond Galligan, Gerald McKinnon, and Thomas Galligan, it's outrageous, in my opinion, that you're playing now in Division 4. Wicklow were brilliant. Wicklow took, the, took them to the sword, but Cavan were there to be taken, and that's my point. I don't think Cavan, with the footballers that they have, should be there for the taking for a team that has been just promoted from Division 4. Yeah, like I thought this Cavan team there would have they got to an all Ireland semi final last year and they would have got dubs uh, gave an awful uh, drubbing, but they definitely thought would have kicked on thinking another Ulster Championship, uh, get promoted uh, back to Division Two. They've had three successive relegations now in a row. So I think they're uh, with the amount of all stars and the footballers they have in the team, it's extremely disappointing for them. But I think it shows you like that besides the top the top eight teams in the country. There's not a whole lot between everyone else. Cavan were in Division 1 there three years ago. Now they're in Division 4, where Wicklow, like on their day, Wicklow can be, uh, go out and be uh, a Kildare Mead, maybe, or a Kildare, or a B. Clare on their day. It, it's all attitude. I don't I think Cavan came up with the, with the right attitudes. And I, I know released there, Shawnee Furlong released, they were, Wicklow were made train on the back pitch or warm up on the back pitch before the match, uh, and Cavan were on the main pitch, and I think the Wicklow lads used it, um, used it as a platform to kind of to express themselves down the pitch. And uh, but yeah, they have a couple of in- injuries Wicklow, which will uh, hamper them. Jamie, Jamie Snell there as an ankle injury. Go, hopefully he'll be fitting out for the extra match. And Dean Healy looks like he's his LCL, so depending on surgery, he probably will. Uh, missed the first championship match but they're playing Wexford now and uh, hopefully getting a win I know the next match after that will be the Dubs but never say no to a uh, to an old championship win especially they're, they're hard to come by when you're uh, you're playing for Wicklow so everyone you uh, you get your treasure yeah and such a local rivalry as well particularly against their neighbours Wexford and uh, speaking of provincial champions getting relegated it seems to be a bit of a team for the weekend as Tipperary the next day, on Sunday, they got relegated, losing by 113 to nine points to Longford. Just an awful performance from Tipperary. A county with such good footballers, the likes of Connor Sween. I know that they're missing a lot of players, but if you're Munster champions, again, you shouldn't be going down to Division 4 when you talk about how good Kerry are looking in Division 1. To think that they're not the Munster champions, a team that just got relegated to Division 4 is the Munster champions. That's bizarre. And... Yeah, for some reason, Tipperary, even though they have achieved great things in the last few years, getting to an All-Ireland final, All-Ireland semi-final sorry, in 2016 and winning the Munster title last year, there seems to be such a disconnect in Tipperary between the football team and the fans and the public. There seems to be no real interest in their footballers, even though they're producing some world-class players. Yeah, definitely. Like I, I, I'd look at Tipperary in the same way I look at Clare. I think... 
the footballers say, play second fiddle a bit to uh, to the hurlers. All the emphasis is on hurling, and you do see it there. With like, even I, I do listen to the two Johnny's podcast a good bit, and they are like they be talking about the about the hurlers, and it, you know everything's hurling, and then the footballers nearly seen as a pub team. So I was I was delighted now when they won the monster championship now, and but then Cork were Cork on now with the right mindset that day, but yeah, no. You were like you were, I wasn't expecting now at all, and one thirteen to nine points is a real, real we we kind of effort against it. Like all you expect from uh, from the teams to give their all, like you know what I mean. And I, I I watched the match and I felt probably Longford didn't do didn't have to do a whole lot or be very impressive to uh, to be uh, Tipperary now. To be honest, yeah, I agree with that. So Longford and Wicklow will play another season. In Division 3, massive for both counties that they avoid relegation. On the other side, Offaly and Derry capped off their brilliant league campaigns, keeping their 100% records intact, beating Offaly B for Mana 114 to 12 points, and Derry beat Limerick. I think huge, huge league campaigns for both sides. I think they both looked fantastic throughout the entire league. Derry, it wasn't as much of a you know one-sided affair as their games have generally been. They beat Limerick by 17 points to 13. And yeah, I mean, they got the job done. How do you see their chances, particularly Derry now? I don't think Offaly really have any chance of winning Leinster, but they continue to look brilliant under John Mohan and the likes of Noah McNamee and Keane Farrell still look like quality footballers. But I'd actually give Derry quite a chance at winning the Ulster Championship just the way that the year is shaping up and how vulnerable the traditional top teams look. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think Mon- or Ulster is completely wide open. You have teams there that could easily, like you saw Fermanagh get to a provincial final there last year. like And Fermanagh now look, no, look nothing like the team they were la- uh, last year now against Offaly today. So I'd put Derry right up there with the likes of Armagh and... And especially when, like, momentum's a big thing in football. Like, they've after winning four games out of four. And, like, if they if they just lost now yesterday against Limerick, that would set them back. But to keep on the winning streak and going into their first game in Ulster, it's uh, it'd be massive for them. If they can get over the first hurdle, you wouldn't you wouldn't know where they could go in the championship. They're definitely building a bit similar to our, our Ma, but just probably not as along as advanced in their development as, as Armagh but definitely I think they, they're they a dark horse in Ulster 100% and on Offaly uh, it was great to see Offaly back in Division get back to Division 2 now I like Offaly have amazing history down through the years you know what I mean stopping Kerry doing five in a row and winning all Ireland's especially it's the same with the hurlers in Offaly as well they need to uh, they need to be back at the top level 100%. The likes of Niall McNamee and Keane Farrell said were exceptional at the weekend. Uh, what worries me a bit with them is for man only 14 men on Donnelly got sent off. What's it called? Two yellow cards he got. Uh, they didn't close the game. It was, I would have liked them to. It's great to see them back. And uh, Personally, I, I hope they push on now. I like Offaly as a, as a footballing county. And yeah, it's great to see them back in Division 2. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think Offaly's history... Everyone in the country has a soft spot for them ever since they stopped the five in a row back in the 80s. Anybody who who knows that knows that awfully with a team that stopped Kerry from gaining immortality. So particularly in Dublin as well, they're held in, in high esteem. Uh, moving on now from Division 3. So Offaly and Derry captured promotion. Moving now to Division 4. Two very successful first years in charge for Mickey Hart and for Enda McGinley. They both claimed promotion for Louth and Antrim, respectively. Mickey Hart is finding his feet now in, the, in charge of Louth. Louth have some very good players, the likes of Sam Mulroy. They gain promotion. Same for Enda McGinley with Antrim. They beat Waterford. Very good years for both of these counties. Wexford beat Sligo in the Division 4 Shield to gain some silverware for themselves. What did you make of these results? Yeah, well, it was delighted now for uh, for Mickey Hart now after all the kind of talk the last three or four years there's been a lot of uh, nearly get rid of him kind of a bit like uh, Arsene Wenger and Arsenal there like uh, a lot of mixed opinions over him because he was a great server now too uh, to Tyrone I know like I don't agree with his football uh, his defensive uh, and I, I think against the best teams like Dublin and Kerry 
it doesn't work as well as the, uh, the defensive side system that the all-out football. And I know Dublin Kerry dropped teams back as well, but I think his system, it worked and now it's kind of figured out a bit. But I was delighted to see him now uh, promotion with Loud. Loud, uh, as you said, Sam O'Roy is moving very well for him. So yeah, I'm delighted, delighted for that. And uh, Wexford, yeah, Wexford, uh, the best Sligo. Sligo, yeah. Wexford looking to find their feet. They did terrible uh, kind of last, end of the last season. Obviously, we bet them. But the likes of Paul Galvin, the, he was manager and they left. he left yeah. there six or seven weeks before the championship started. So it was obviously a big loss to him. I'd say it was expected to stay in Division 4 for them now. But next year, I'd be looking at them to gain promotion because Wexford have, have great history as well in football. Like they have a couple of great club teams down there. We played Castletown and a friend last year, and absolute amazing history. Like, and then Antrim are back in are back in Division Three as well. That was probably did probably expected as well. They had a horrible end to last season as well. I know uh, they had a lot of COVID cases there last year, resulting in a couple of uh, hidings they got. Uh, in Division Four, so there as well they probably see themselves kind of forgotten giants up there in uh, Ulster, but I wouldn't say they they'll they'll be looking now at a couple of championship wins. Ulster is very competitive. There's not really one county up in Ulster that I look at and think, oh, this is going to be a hiding. Ulster compared to like to compare to Leinster provincial championship, it's it's so competitive. Yeah. Definitely. Um, and Antrim, they have a bit of a baptism of fire in the championship. They play against Armagh in the quarterfinal at the athletic ground. So I think that will be one step too far to them. But under McGinley, I do see them giving a good account to themselves, at least. Yeah, 100%. They'll definitely, there's, there'll be no, they're nothing short of a, of heart and effort in that game anyway. It's like anything, you always, like Mayo, you always raise your game to if it's a derby match or... Rivals, hundred percent. They'll uh, they'll be up for that, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised now if there's not too much in it. Come near the end of the game. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so that's our coverage now of Division Four and Division Three finished. Uh, Kieran, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for coming on. Cheers to that, Seamus. Really enjoyed it now. Yeah. Uh, really great. You're doing you're doing deadly now at the media with you and Luke. It's uh, really gone well, and I'll be sure to listen for for the future anyway. Yeah, no, it was a pleasure to have you on. All right, so thanks for listening, guys. We hope you enjoyed the podcast and uh, take care.